So if you are here this evening, you most likely have an interest in the history of Whateley in general and in the Historical Society's current exhibition in particular. You may perhaps even be interested in picture books for children and in how some of them come to be. Or on the other hand, you may be here because I twisted your arm or begged or bribed you into coming to provide some moral support and the comfort of seeing familiar faces in the audience. Whatever your reason, thank you for being here. It is hoped that you will find something to take away with you tonight. Before I get too far, I want, to, I want you to know that I'm not just some interloper from Hatfield and that there is Waitley in my past. Though I may be a native of Hatfield, Hatfield and Waitley and Williamsburg were all one and the same up until 1771, when Waitley and Williamsburg decided to break loose, declare themselves independent from Hatfield and from each other, and go it alone. My grandparents, Dan and Kate Riley, lived in the house. Whoops. Oh. It's not going. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, lived in the house right next door to this building for many, many years, and I spent some of the most enjoyable hours of my own childhood from its very beginnings here in Whateley. <laughs> Coming up here was, for this child, like going to another world, or at least to what seemed like the very top of this one. The years passed, memories grew, and so did I. Though not realized at the time, as is often the case with children, so too did affection for and appreciation of this idyllic corner of the planet. The freedom to roam safely and without restraint probably had more of an effect on my future somewhat willful approach to illustrating than, vi than did visits to the Whateley Library, then overseen by Mrs. Kane, or even the best efforts of my dear sister to get me interested in such high quality works mm -hmm. as Little Lulu as seen here on the right. At school, the pictures accompanying the adventures of Dick and Jane, and even of poor Spot, were not memorable visually, especially in the opinion of my mother, who was raised on beautifully illustrated classics. You have some fine examples on display downstairs. In fine weather, a great adventure might be had walking, picnic in hand, to the serene center of Whateley, from the equally magnificent, but more bustling center of North Hatfield, where we lived. There too had been located my grandfather's business, which is advertised and immortalized <clears throat> in the center of your beautifully restored stage curtain that is at the moment hidden behind the screen here. And then there were the times spent cooling off and eventually learning to swim at Westbrook, or EO as we called it then for some reason, it seemed so big at the time. Thanksgiving was always looked forward to with great anticipation as over the river, and maybe not through, but at least alongside a pleasant stretch of woods, now officially known as the Whateley Center Woods, to grandmother's welcoming aroma-filled house we would go. The house itself must have planted, <clears throat> planted in me a love for the look and feel of things old, of buildings and settings and objects. And this would eventually end up being helpful with historical illustration. The attic held treasures of no interest to others perhaps, but fascinating to a child old furniture and mysterious trunks containing top hats and shawls and old glasses stood next to barrels full of butternuts that the squirrels that somehow found their way into the attic could be heard playing hockey with during the night or with which a child could practice her golf game using the ancient clubs that were to be found up there as well. 
If some of those extremely hard-shelled butternuts were required for my grandmother's panucci, my grandfather, seen here with the town hall in the background, would be called to the rescue with his ax. This service was also required on occasion when very small garter snakes were to be found in the pantry. But not to worry, the reptiles always managed to escape unharmed, as opposed to some of the crockery. Even the view from the upstairs bathroom of the house was spectacular. Looking out as it did over all of the universe as I knew it then, with its hills and its fields, its river and its farms, and its own very special way of life. Although my artistic efforts at that time screamed, no child prodigy here, I kept at it. And much later, when I finally began to paint a little more seriously, all that had been unconsciously absorbed over the years began to come out, and it has been informing my work ever since. My very first intentional attempt at an oil painting was inspired by the produce at a farm stand down on Route 5. Rusin's, I think it was, just to the north of what was once Graves' restaurant. And as was so often the case, the credit for the composition belonged to the owners of the stand themselves and not to me. Images of Waitley and of Hatfield too, continued to make their appearance over and over again. One of my favorite things to do when a child was getting to go with my father in, and sometimes on the back of, a truck of slightly more recent vintage than the one pictured on your curtain to make deliveries, whoops, there it is, to make deliveries of coal or flour, chicken or cattle feed, and all sorts of other farming necessities from my grandfather's mill and retail store. We go to places such as Mrs. Robbins's on Conway Road, Scott's Farm on North Street, and even farther up North Street to the Baroness Dairy Farm. That farm is depicted here in a painting titled Hillside Going Home, a very early and certainly not very accurate attempt at recreating the memory of a place where the warmth of the barn, the gentle noises and the wet noses of the cows, the friendly resident cats, the sound of the grain going down the chute, and even all of the smells were like heaven to a little girl. During a period of time when small still lifes were the main focus of my efforts, produce from the valley continued to provide subject material. It came mostly from the Galunka farm in Waitley, where Sonia, who is truly and deeply missed, kindly posed for me one year. Whatever vegetables and fruits were in season, and whose colors and shapes called out to be painted, were gathered up on the weekend and arranged into compositions to be worked on during the week. This I still do. My first encounter with the real world of children's book illustration came as a result of a request by a friend. He had written a book of folk tales based on his Peace Corps days in West Africa and was in need of some pictures to accompany it. There followed a few other African folk tale collections by various authors that were in need of small pen and ink drawings or perhaps a cover. And that, I assumed, was that. And back to the solitary life of a painter, I went. How she did it, I do not know. But some 20 plus years later, Jane Yolen remembered those less than memorable efforts. She suggested me for illustrating the children's book that Smith College had commissioned her to write for the 200th anniversary of the birth of Sophia Smith, the college's founder. The story was as local as one could get, especially when taken into account was the fact that the three of us, the subject, the author, and the illustrator, were all Hatfield residents at one time or another. Oops, I think 
I missed something. Oh, there she is. Okay. There she is. And so it came to be. Although I had no idea what would be involved, no idea what was expected of me, but perhaps that was a good thing in the end. What I did soon learn was that, even way back then, a modern day children's picture book requires action, exaggeration of expression, and in this particular instance, dragons. What all concerned soon learned was that this painter of the familiar, who was quite set in her ways, might not be willing to change or even capable of changing overnight her way of seeing and of doing things and thus of producing all that might be hoped for. A poor, perhaps subconsciously deliberate attempt at a dragon was proof enough that a quiet realism was more of what I could accomplish as opposed to something wildly imaginative. All involved seemed to accept this fact graciously, especially as time was of the essence. It is best, I think, to paint or to write about that which one knows, and thankfully, at least I knew a little about Hatfield. The story concerns a little girl who meets Miss Smith and discovers that she is not the crabby, scary old dragon, as was the word among the other children in the town. Although it is a work of fiction, tons of research needed to be done. I wanted the pictures to be as much about the town and what life there might have looked like in the 1860s as they would be about the tale itself. Fortunately, the town's main street, like Quaitley's, hasn't changed too much since then. Everything needed to be looked into, including clothing for children and for adults, hairstyles, interior decoration, transportation, food and etiquette, and so much more. With every book based on history that I was to illustrate, being faithful to the times in which it took place was very important to me. So too was using real models. A neighbor's granddaughter became Louisa, the book's main character, and several stood in for Sophia Smith. If anyone is interested in a much more in-depth look at the making of Tea with an Old Dragon, one can be found on the Hatfield Historical Society's YouTube channel. Having by then been tagged as an illustrator of things historical, and perhaps because it was by then known that I could be trusted not to put five legs on a horse, as another of their illustrators had done, it was still a huge surprise when I got a call from the same publisher asking if I would be interested in illustrating Paul Revere's ride. Who could say no to the undeserved privilege of seeing one's name oops, on, paired on a book jacket with that of the likes of Longfellow? Even though the project would call for much more action and expressiveness than I knew I could manage, and even though portraying nighttime would be a new and rather alarming challenge, I couldn't wait to get started. By car as well as on foot, Paul Revere's route was retraced from Boston to Charlestown through Medford and Arlington. The trails and buildings at the Minuteman historical sites in Lexington and Lincoln were visited countless times as were the Concord Bridge and its environs. Pilgrimages were made to any other possibly related locations that were hopefully little changed since 1775, or at least unchanged enough so that with research they could be imagined as they might have looked then. For months and for miles around, every reenactment and every dress rehearsal for those reenactments, if known about, was attended. Everyone encountered at those places and events was cooperative and kind, from the national lancer who played the role of Paul Revere 
to the high school metalworking class that made and gifted me with a reproduction of the lantern hung in the belfry of the Old North Church on that famous night. The love and enthusiasm each one had for his or her job or avocation was contagious. It was a truly enjoyable experience. Two events stand out in my memory. As is my want, I had to witness for myself the moon rising over the bay. On a clear evening, when a full moon was scheduled and as close to April 18th as possible, we drove into Charlestown, parked in a lot by the bay, and waited and waited and waited some more until finally there it was, the moon, huge as it rose over the water, overwhelming, breathtaking, how it may have appeared on that very night and how Longfellow may have witnessed it as well. The camera could not do it justice. A friend, always up for anything and obviously used to more exciting adventures, agreed to the relatively calm and safe task of guiding her rowboat across the pond at the family farm for what would eventually become the illustration of Paul Revere crossing the bay from the north end of Boston to the shores of Charlestown, all within sight of the formidable Somerset British man of war. A side note here on trying to get the smallest of details right. In yet another rendition of the book, the illustrator seems to have used the U.S. Constitution as a model for the man of war. The Constitution, however, was not even launched until 1797. The other event I found unforgettable was the skit put on every year of Revere riding up to the house in Lexington, where John Hancock and Samuel Adams were staying in order to warn them to get out of town, ASAP, as yes, the British, while the other British were indeed coming to capture them and to learn their plans. It is midnight and completely silent, even with onlookers, including small children present. The atmosphere is filled with a tension that only increases when, in the distance, one can hear the sound of a lone horse's hoofbeats getting closer and closer until that night's Paul Revere, astride that night's brown beauty, appears out of the darkness, now shouting a warning for all to hear. The spell is, of course, broken, and all heck breaks loose. But what a thrilling experience it was, at least it was for me. Fortunately, even way out here, one is close enough to go and witness the Patriots' Day activities or just to walk in the footsteps of those who were there in 1775. If you haven't ever done so, I highly recommend it. Next year especially, there should be a lot going on. For the book, I had devised a visual structure, an arc, where Revere would be heading away from the reader, then, oops, there he is, um, would be, away from the reader, then paralleling the page before coming back toward the reader again. The poem is, I feel, meant for all ages, and I wanted the illustrations to appeal to all ages, too. Uh -oh. <laughs> Halfway through the painting of them, however, I unfortunately got sick, and during the year lost, several truly excellent swashbuckling versions of the poem came out. It was, after all, the 225th anniversary of the ride. One reviewer, however, liked my efforts best because she felt that they captured Boston and the poem's other locations as she knew them, and that was enough for me. Another call was soon to come. The publishers had not yet given up on me, although they eventually would. They wondered if I would consider illustrating a book on the life of Noah Webster, a life about which, I am ashamed to say, I knew very little. Oh dear, I keep getting one behind. Oh well. Um, 
Some time was needed to think this over, and that time was spent doing a little reading. Reading that turned up a staggering amount of information about an extraordinary man. The timing was good, and as my stomach, the usual arbiter of such things, had no strong objections, I agreed to do it, and not just because I have trouble saying no. There were so many local connections that could be made, and Webster's times, like those of Paul Revere, remain my favorite in the history of American architecture, furniture, and the decorative arts. Plus, it was discovered, he grew asparagus, one of my most beloved vegetables. What more could one ask for? So, after hopping off the relatively short and direct trail of Paul Revere, I hopped right on to the long and winding one of Noah Webster. Creating pictures to accompany the tale of his incredibly full life would be much different than envisioning those needed for the poem about the midnight ride. Though all that had led up to it and all that resulted from it had to be looked into, Paul Revere's ride was about a single event that took place along a well-known path during a few hours one lovely April evening. The story of Noah Webster, however, is of such breadth and depth and length that it would require a more wide-ranging investigation. Noah Webster grew up in the house in West Hartford where he was born in 1758. He spent most of his life in the Connecticut River Valley. He attended Yale College and was a member of the Connecticut militia during the Revolutionary War. He became a teacher and a lawyer as well as a writer whose considerable output dealt with such subjects as agriculture and science, morality and religion, politics and abolition, sanitation, nutrition, medicine, and especially education. In addition to his Dictionary of the American Language, he contributed his blue backed speller, both key to his belief that our then young country should have its own unifying language. Webster spent many years right across the river in Amherst, where besides becoming a founder of Amherst College and the Three County Fair, he worked on his dictionary and conducted agricultural experiments, many articles concerning which appeared in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and can be found at Forbes Library today. Research for the story was carried out in my usual bumbling fashion. There was just more of it that needed to be done. Lists, lists, and even lists of lists were made of places to go, people to see, phone calls to make, photographs to take, computer searches to be done. Post-its soon covered every available surface books on any subject that could possibly provide even the smallest clue about the life and time of Noah Webster's Webster began to pile up, way up. Auction catalogs and antiques magazines to be scoured were spread about everywhere. Notebooks began to fill. Folders started to bulge with clippings of baskets and candlesticks, men on horseback and women at tea. Scraps of paper covered with tiny rough sketches were soon scattered throughout the house, and they could also be found in the car and in just about every pocket of every piece of clothing that I owned. Hundreds of possible illustrations began to fill my head, and with each one came even more questions. It was enough to make this already befuddled brain burst, and things were just getting started. A manuscript arrived, and though it too was still evolving, it was helpful in narrowing down image possibilities. At times it was discouraging, as a wonderful composition might suggest itself, but have to be rejected because it was something I knew I was not capable of carrying out, due either to a lack of time or more likely to a lack of ability. As pictures arranged themselves in my mind's eye, 
and as they were ever so tentatively put down on paper, what was still needed made itself known, and what was still needed was overwhelming. More books were sought and found and accumulated. Bookstores, antiquarian used and new, and libraries, large and small, were visited with great frequency. Borrowed or purchased were books on Mount Vernon and Old Philadelphia, on the history of Yale and the painters of the Hudson River School, on the Revolutionary War and the militias of the Connecticut colony. Fragile tomes containing the earliest possible images of Noah himself and of the towns in which he lived were perused with care. Even a catalog of reproduction clothing proved invaluable. Not only did it denote the changes in fashion that occurred during the span of Noah's life, but from it was purchased a fine black suit for my husband, who had been roped into portraying the adult Noah Webster, complete with red hair. He donned it gamely and with great patience whenever he was called upon to do so, and that was often. Others were lined up to pose when the time came. Neighborhood children, nieces and nephews, siblings, in-laws, my at the time 100-year-old mother, all would make their way into the pictures. Even my cat condescended to pose, but only for a moment. Meanwhile, the list of props needed for every possible picture grew and grew. Objects had been collected all along, Yet there was still a need for quill pens, teapots, a flute, a blueback speller, and what seemed like a million other things. If all else failed, could a black magic marker transform an overturned cat food can into an authentic looking inkwell? Could a semicircle be cut out of a large piece of cardboard in order to turn an ordinary table into Noah's well documented desktop? Could several sheets of green tissue paper be crafted into a real enough looking cover for it? Although great efforts were always made to get things right, mistakes are surely to be found in all of my illustrations. Just one of the many unnerving things about attempting to provide illustrations for historical works is being aware that there is always someone out there who knows or who thinks they know all there is to know about everything. <laughs> Even more trips were planned and executed in earnest now to destinations that seemed necessary to the story of Noah Webster, or that might at least provide a proper setting. With sketchbook and camera in hand and a willing husband in tow, I again took to the Webster Trail and this time headed from his by then oft visited birthplace and its accompanying museum on to New Haven, where first the Yale campus was visited. There still stands Connecticut Hall, where Noah lived during his time at the school. A stop at the New Haven Historical Society yielded early pictures of the house, now gone, in which Noah and his young family lived during what has been described as the happiest time of his life. Here he is ahead of his time, advising his children to eat a peck of fruit each day. Lastly, a stop was made at the cemetery where it can be assumed what remains of Noah resides today. It turned out that this picture could not be used in the book as the powers that be found it too offensive for eight to 12 year olds. Eight to 12 year olds who were during that era quite possibly playing Grand Theft Auto or the like. <laughs> a, a trip to Sturbridge Village was required to view early farm life. Historic Deerfield was visited in order to study its architecture and paint colors. It's recreated 18th century gardens and its print shop. One fine day, a restored 18th century schoolhouse in Vermont was the destination. My absolute favorite excursion for this book, however, was one made to the banks of the Hudson on a gorgeous October day. It had, of 
of course, <clears throat> to be as close as possible to the date Noah and his brothers and his father were there, not only to try and get the light and the landscape somewhat right, but also to look for and to stand on a spot from which the Websters just might have watched Kingston burn back in 1777. For me, there is no substitute for going, for seeing, for touching. Some things just need to be experienced before they can even be applied in a painting. The crunch of snow beneath one's feet on a cold winter's day, the light at dusk, the creak of an ancient printing press, the smell of an old leather binding, the presence of a magnificent horse, the way in which an old house has settled into its surroundings, the coziness of a candlelit room, the wear on an old pine floor, the textures of muslin and linen, the flavor of an heirloom apple. For every illustration in every book, I settled upon a year, a day, an hour, a location. I decided how many figures, if any, would be in each picture, and whether those figures would be standing or sitting, seen from the front or the back, from the side or at an angle, from up close or far away, indoors or out, and what exactly would they be up to? There needed to be enough variety from picture to picture, in subject matter, in composition, in color, and in light. Yet each image had to be thought of in terms of what came before it and what came after in order to create a visual flow from one to the next. Rough storyboards like these were useful here. And also for my own satisfaction, each illustration had to be able to stand on its own without the text to lean on. Every square inch of every illustration was thought about, every inclusion deliberate, and for just about every picture, especially for this Philadelphia scene, little stories were concocted. There comes a time, however, when no more can be absorbed, and that time had come. Sketches needed to be finalized and copies sent to the publishers. Criticism was awaited and received, all seven pages worth. Where corrections made sense, they were made, but the unreasonableness of others, when added to the difficulties that had already begun to pile up, nearly ended my association with this particular project. But all of that is another story for another time. Suffice it to say that bridges were burned with the flames reaching heights greater than those seen by the Webster boys as they viewed the burning of Kingston. My services would not be requested by this publisher again, but onward. The illustrations would be done, as usual, in oil on board. My method of working is painstaking and slow, but somehow things progress to near completion when time at last ran out. Although I came to it from a slightly different world, I love illustrating and the research and the planning and the total involvement that it requires. As I saw it, my responsibility for each book was, hopefully, to come up with visually interesting and historically accurate pictures to enhance the words of others, and perhaps to inspire just one reader to learn more about the people, the events, and the times being written about. Even to follow physically the path of Noah Webster, say, from his birthplace to his terribly offensive gravesite, visiting many of the places in between that are open to the public, becoming more acquainted with the works of this great educator along the way. And this finally brings us back in a very roundabout way to childhood in Waitley. Webster's aforementioned blue back speller was to be found in almost every schoolhouse in this country from the 1790s to the 1830s and even beyond, to which this revised 1857 example, once owned by one Holmes Avery of Williamsburg, can attest. 
chances are pretty good that the speller was to be found in Waitley's many early schools, too. A while back, the Hatfield Historical Society received a donation of some assorted documents, a number of which related to Whaley. Among them was a contract from 1813 between the town of Whaley and one Amos Pratt to build a schoolhouse. The contract contained detailed specifications as to what it would cost, what it would be made of, what it would look like, and where it would be located on a site that somehow involved Haydenville and Weber Roads. We set out to discover where it might have been, looking from the car for signs, remains, cellar holes, old cart paths, anything, driving around and around, stopping and starting up again, being very surprised that no one called the local constabulary to report such suspicious activity. We could have been languishing in the Whateley <laughs> Lava, if one exists, for days and days. My husband wrote a much more informative post about the contract that can be found on the Hatfield Historical Society's blog page. The words called out for a little illustration, and though it may not be 100% correct, I think it could be fairly close to what the schoolhouse looked like in its then more open landscape. And so with that, I will bring an end to this. Thank goodness for that, some of you are surely thinking. Thank you all for your patience, and please know that it has been a pleasure to be here in Whaley today, as it was a pleasure on so many other days so many years ago. And so I will end here with the painting of some pine berries from Whateley's Norse Farms. So I think that that will be it.